Hi folks, um, this is a, a, a video basically on Scottish sovereignty. Uh, it's titled as a sovereign's wish, and you'll find out um, as we as we get on with the, the video. Okay, this is a, a learning aid. It's to raise awareness of what's happening within Scotland and the corruption that's happening within within the courts and things like that. Okay, and the Crown Corporation. All right. Um, along with this here, I have also submitted a lot of facts. Uh, a lot of effort and a lot of uh, research has went into this. Okay, there is um, no legal advice as such. We don't give legal advice, um, but what it is is it does raise awareness of our our constitutional rights and things like that. Okay. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. <clears throat> so there have been many misunderstandings about the Scottish sovereigns and how they're trying to disobey statutes the council tax and TV licenses etc by claiming that they do not consent to these so-called laws that are corporate rulings and they claim these rulings need consent in order for them to apply. So here are just a few of the judgmental statements found on some chat sites. Okay so we've got these people are wasters just trying to beat the system. Who are this group that call themselves the Scottish Sovereigns? They're idiots if they believe the laws do not apply to them. And we've got, they must have too much time on their hands to look for these technicalities and the loopholes. Just abide by the law. <laughs> no wonder I'm laughing. So, <clears throat> based on my research on this subject, I'm now going to explain the facts on this. And for those who are the creators of the contradicting statements, hopefully this will aid in your understanding. And if you're still not convinced, then at least provide the facts to support your contradictions. Okay. So, this is my research on it. Um, do, also do your own research. Okay, folks, you cannot, we can't emphasize it enough. Do your own research. Go and look at the, the law books and the, the statutes and things like that and regulations that are in place. Have a look at them. Have a read them for yourself. Okay, don't just take somebody's word for it. The non, no authorised representatives of the Crown or courts have argued this so-called theory. It's all patently just ignored. It's not about trying to beat the so-called system. It's not about finding technicalities or loopholes in so-called laws. It's not about trying to avoid paying for something that is supposedly law and non-negotiable. It's actually about abiding by the system and that is the only law system that applies in Scotland and that is common law, not statutes. Okay, this will be explained a wee bit more detail just, just later on. Okay. In accordance to Scots law, the Scottish people are sovereign. If you do not know what the word sovereign means, then here it is. So sovereign is one that exercises supreme permanent authority, a king, queen or other noble person who serves as chief of state, a ruler or monarch. So if the people are sovereign, then that makes them the rulers of the state. They are the kings and queens of our, we are the kings and queens of our country. Okay, we are the highest supreme authority. Now, Based on this, um, there was a memorandum going about uh, issued by the, the or issued either to or by the Scottish Court Service in accordance to, to things that are getting or which is happening in courts. Um, on that memorandum, it states that they are to be aware of these people that call themselves free men or free man in the land or they're Scottish sovereigns or they are sovereign men and women. Um, it's basically saying that they've just to ignore it. Um, and that uh, they've just to go to trial without any evidence. Now, I've read this memorandum. It's it's quite sad to, to say the least about you know if, that, if that's the ways ways of doing things. There's I've got all the evidence here about us being sovereign. Okay. Now the free man thing and the free man in the land um, is more of of an English uh, theory. All right. Um, which uh, you know they 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 are probably right. Uh, I'm sure that comes from the the Magna Carta. Uh, in Scotland, however, we have a unique principle, okay, and that principle is that the Scottish people are sovereign. Alright, so that's what we are, we are Scottish sovereigns, we're, we're, we're sovereign men and women. 
Okay, for the Scottish courts, I was to argue that case is it's, it's just not on. It's it's, it's very silly actually, um, especially with what we're about to see here with with all the evidence that, that I've gathered for this video. Um, in Scotland, people are also known as lieges. Okay. So look at the word liege, which is mentioned within Scots law, and you'll find that also means superior, such as king or queen. Okay, so the other people out there, they're your fellow lieges. Okay, look up what that, that is as well within Scots law. And that's mentioned quite a lot also. I myself also found the Scottish sovereign principle to be a bit dubious, as I spent my whole life being brought up in a system where Parliament rule and that we, the Scots people, must obey their authority and their laws. You're led to believe this is how it is, and this has been the case for a long time. This is how it is easily misunderstood. If you look at it this way, okay, your brain is like a computer. If you put rubbish in, you will only understand rubbish. So basically, if the government tells you something to be true, we usually take it to be true, even if it's not. They have a very powerful influence on our minds. Okay, this goes back to, you know, from from the start nursery. It's the government, a parliament that, that set out the educational framework. Yep, so that's us, that's, that's right from that early age when we hit nursery, right through our school, school years. They have a very powerful influence on our minds, and this is us now. This is them trying to educate us, or educate uh, to educate us to their system. Okay, uh, educating us in how to contract without even knowing we're doing it. All right, and the word government, as you can see from the slide there, govern meant means actually means control of mind. Okay, very important that you we understand that and we can see that there. Government control of mind. So, we're talking about the Scottish Sovereigns, I was not going to mock what the Scottish uh, Sovereigns were saying, because what if they were right? What if I was the high superior over any police constable, any court, any government, the Palace of Westminster and the monarchy? And if I'm known as a liege, then that would make me a sovereign king, as well as every other residing Scot out there. Obviously, your females there, they would be queens. So you need, it's very important that you that you do research all this stuff for yourself, okay? And that's what I've done. So I'm not going to just take someone's word for it, nor do I accept someone's opinion to be fact. Therefore, it was my intention to seek the facts for myself, just like you should. Don't just take my word for it. So here is what I have found, along with the references to substantiate the facts. So I'll start off with the confusion of common law and statutes. Common law basically covers loss, harm or injury. If it's your intention to cause loss, harm or injury to a fellow liege, then you have committed a crime Okay, under common law. So such things are assaults, murder, theft, arson, criminal damage, sexual offences, uh, breach of the peace is also a common law offence. And these are just a few of them, there's, there's a lot more out there, but these are the kind of most common ones All right, that come under common law. Okay, loss, harm or injury. To be guilty of a crime, there must be two ingredients present and that is actus reus. Okay, that's the fact that it happened. The other ingredient there would be mens re, the mental intent. Okay, so you have to willfully have caused loss, harm or injury and the actus reus, the evidence, the fact that that happened has to also be present, all right, for you to be, uh, for, for, for you to have committed a crime, okay, or charged for a crime. All right, so that's the two ingredients that need to be there. Best way to establish if a common law crime has been committed is to ask yourself, is there a victim that has suffered loss, harm or injury? With common law, there is always a victim or complainer in regards to any sufferance. Common law is known as God's law or the law of the land and it derives from the Bible and the decisions of judges. 
statutes or rules as if they are law. They are acts based on possibility, so they're saying things like this might have happened or that could have happened. It's all hypothetical. Because it didn't actually happen, then all it remains is just a thought. Nobody has actually suffered any loss, harm or injury. Statutes and acts originate from the law of the sea. They were the rules that were imposed on the corporate shipment of goods as commercial contracts. This is basically similar to a contract of employment. Okay, so your your the statutes that's where they originate from is the law of the sea. The law of the sea is admiralty. That's your admiral law. Okay, so way back hundreds of years ago, um, ships were the only way of um, of, of doing business. Yeah, of you know that's that's the only way they could operate is using ships. Um, because the, the, the people were off the land, then they created the laws of the sea, which is Admiralty Law, and that's where statutes come from. It's all commercial law, uh, Admiralty Law, it's, you know, statutory law, that, that's what it's all called, okay? It isn't actual law, okay? The law only applies to the people on the land, and that is common law. The statutes and Admiralty stuff and things like that, these are just rulings that have been made up. It's all contracts okay it's all agreements it's all contractual so it's known as maritime law or admiral law as it originated from the sea and can only apply through contracting by contracting you waive your fundamental rights and your freedoms very important word used in there as well the word wave okay it's the sea the waves of the sea you waive your rights Okay, this is, again, this, this is a word that we use in our, our everyday English language, but it has a kind of legal sense there, okay, and the word actually derives from the sea. You contract or consent through acquiescence. Now, acquiescence is either silence, signature, action, uh, and or verbal. Alright. If a statement is uttered and you say nothing, then you have agreed. Okay, if you do not object to something that's been sent to you or said about you, then it is taken to be accepted. Okay, so silence is an agreement. Be careful about that as well. Okay, especially in court cases and things, you're in court and something's been made, a statement's been made about you, and you haven't objected to it, and then it stands as you agree to that. If you sign a piece of paper, then you agree to the terms and conditions of it. So be careful what you sign. If you're asked to stand and you stand, then you've agreed by action. Okay, so these are also things that are known as implied consent. You don't have to verbally say it or you don't have to um, sign for something. You can also give consent by action. Yep, implied consent. If somebody says to you, come over here, and you went over, then you've consented by action. Okay, implied consent. If you're asked a question and do not answer carefully, then you could agree verbally, so be very careful in how you answer. Okay, you could be coerced into contracts, yep, by not understanding what you're actually saying. Okay, now this is where proper English words can be mixed up with the legal sense of words, so what something means in English might mean something completely different in the legalese language. Okay, so be very careful how you answer something. So as soon as you agree or have given consent, then you have contracted. Okay, contracts make law. Okay, it's then become civil. It is a civil law. Looking at the next sec part here about constitution. Okay, so what is a constitution? A constitution is basically a list of fundamental rights and freedoms. So in the course to Scottish constitutional law, we have these fundamental rights and freedoms. Okay, a constitution doesn't give us our rights, it merely lists the rights that we already have and it's up to us to use them. We either waive these rights or limit them every time we enter into anything legal. 
Um, so the next bit there is basically the proof. Are we sovereign? The answer is is clearly yes. Okay, based on that bit I was talking about just the other on there, but that memorandum going about from the Scottish Court Service and people, uh, the men and women are standing up in the dock and declaring that they're sovereignty and things like that, and this just to be ignored pretty much. Absolutely, that's absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. We are sovereign, and I'm going to provide the the, the proof and evidence uh, to to that fact as well. <clears throat> so here's the evidence. We've got the Declaration of a Broth 1320. This is a fundamental document that was passed into Scots constitutional law by the sovereign people. It declares Scotland's independence as a sovereign state and that we, the Scots people, are sovereign and the government and the monarch is contracted to fulfil their duties in accordance to the sovereign's wish. If Parliament and the monarch do not fulfil their contractual duties in accordance to the sovereign's wish, then we can re-elect another Parliament and or monarch. Robert the Bruce also states that as long as a hundred of us remain alive, we will never come under English rule. Okay, so it's very important that we get as many people uh, on this same wavelength and get people to understand their actual rights here. Okay, this is a fundamental document that still actually has power to this day. Again, it's just been hidden or covered and we're not getting taught it. Very, very important. Okay, um, we bit I'm going to play here as an audio as well in regards to this declaration of broth, and it's from Nicola Sturgeon, from uh, who's an MSP, he's a cabinet minister who uh, has made this speech in Holyrood, which is your, your Scottish Parliament uh, building over in Edinburgh. Okay, um, what she says about this is very very interesting about the Scottish sovereignty. Listen very carefully to it. Um, at the, as it kind of goes on, you'll hear her talking about the Scottish uh, Claim of Right Act 1689 things, which is the next section I'm going to talk about. Um, but this here is, is, is very uh, interesting, what she's got to say about sovereignty. That one sentence, presiding officer, is charged with historical resonance, and not just for people in this chamber, but for everybody in Scotland, it reaffirms the ancient principle that in Scotland the people are sovereign. Uh, monarchs and parliaments are the servants of the people. Uh, that's a fine principle and one which has its origins in the declaration of our broth. It was refined by George Buchanan in the late 16th century and restated in Scotland's first claim of right in 1689. And 300 years later, a new claim of right was proclaimed by the Scottish Constitutional Convention. Uh, that 1989 claim of right was signed by uh, all Liberal Democrat MPs. I see we only have one uh, with us in the chamber today, uh, including the current Advocate General and all but two Labour MPs. Its wording is therefore repeated in today's motion. Uh, the founding principle of that claim of right is one that all parties which have taken their place in this Parliament should be able to subscribe to. And there has never been a more important moment to recommit ourselves to the guiding principle of the claim of right that the people, the Scottish people, are sovereign. So there you go. <clears throat> Comes from that as well. Okay, that's uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the MSP, who is, you know, it's, it's pretty much ties up in a nutshell exactly, you know, where we stand within Scotland and our sovereignty. Next section here is the Claim of Right Act 1689. Now you have just heard uh, Nicholas Sturgeon talk a wee bit about that there. Okay. Uh, but this is a, a key document of Scottish constitutional law and this also reinstates the sovereignty of the people. This sets out the contractual duties of both the Parliament and the Monarch in accordance to the Sovereign's wish. Again, if this is not fulfilled accordingly, then the Sovereign people shall re-elect. This is still the case today and is for all time. Okay, it's for all time it cannot be uh, repealed. Again, please check this out for yourself. So there's the Claim of Right Act 1689. Have a wee look at that, folks. Have a wee bit of research on that. And get that on the, the legislation.gov uh, uh, website. And uh, 
it's it's written it's quite traditional from a traditional Scottish sense the way how it's written and things like that. Um, but it's good and that again re reinstates or reiterates our, our actual fundamental rights and freedoms. Okay, in accordance between us, the people and our parliaments and our and our monarchy. Very, very interesting. Okay, very interesting document and it is still enforced to this day. Upon the birth of the UK Parliament in 1707, both Scotland and England passed the Acts of Union in order to share the same Parliament. So that was basically one Parliament, but with two responsibilities. Under Article 19 of the 1707 Treaty of Union, okay, which is the same as the, the Act of Union, the independence of Scots law and Scottish constitutional practice is protected for all time. So the UK Parliament also have a duty to uphold these fundamental rights and constitutional practice in accordance to the wishes of the sovereign people. This is not done. Okay, the UK Parliament have basically took English law and, and have started incorporating it into, into Scotland. Okay, it's a big it's a big no no, it's not supposed to be done. The Declaration of Broth and the Claim of Right Act are protected for all time, so why are we letting these people Rule or rule us or control us out with our own constitution. We need it's because we're not aware of it, so this is why it's very important that people are aware of where they stand. Okay, we need to make changes now. More evidence there uh, of our sovereignty, McCormack v. the Lord Advocate 1953. This is a court session case. Um, what he states and things that within that case. Uh, it's basically the, the blown up of the post boxes because they had E2R on them uh, with Queen Elizabeth being the Queen Elizabeth the uh, second of England uh, but the, she was the first of, of, of Scotland, in fact she wasn't even Queen of Scotland, she's only the Queen of the Scottish people because we have actually elected her as our Queen she's actually, she's she's there in contract okay, to, to, the, to the people, so she's Queen of Scots, not actually, of, not of Scotland Okay, because Scotland is a, it's a sovereign state, it's our country, it's our land. But Lord Cooper, in this case, uh, had made over a statement there, which is um, the principle of unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctively English principle and has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. Therefore, the sovereignty lies with the people of Scotland. Okay, it's not the Crown of Parliament. We are the ones that are supposed to decide what happens. Okay, we are the ones that are supposed to be accountable for the legislation that's passed in Scotland also. We are the ones that should be making the decision whether we agree to, to the to the legislations or not. So there's a lot of things out there where I agree to these legis or, or, or abiding by these legislations but we don't agree to them. Then it's up to us to, to step up to our mark now and, and use our position of sovereignty now to, to rid these out, get rid of these statutes that, that we don't consent to. Just another way to get money out of us. Got another piece of evidence here, which is Christine Graham, uh, also an MSP. Um, very, very good audio here, uh, and she pretty much ties everything up here in a nutshell in accordance to the, the Declaration of Our Bro, the Claim of Right Act 1689, um, uh, the session case we just spoke about there from, from Lord Cooper. Very, very interesting speech now that she, she comes out with. So, this kind of ties everything up. So, if you'd like to have a you know, we listen to this audio. Um, and hopefully this will help your understanding. Officer, I have to agree with uh, David McCletchie that power devolved is indeed power retained. We are talking about obtaining independence. And he also knows, as a divorce lawyer, as I was myself, that when one, when one party sees the end of the marriage, the marriage is at an end, the detail is then negotiated according to law and practice. The same would happen in a dissolution between two parts of a united uh, kingdom. I think it's important, however, to work back sometimes to why certain assertions are made, for example, in the claim of rights that the Scottish people are sovereign. So much slips into our everyday parlance that has a deep-rooted and substantive cultural or constitutional genesis. For example, when you hear Scots reprimanded for saying, I seen it, or I done it, this is in fact language that is grammatical, phrases that have survived through centuries of spoken Scots. They are not lazy or ignorant slang, but an echo from the past. 
which takes me to the claim of right in 1989 and the words we gathered as the Scottish Constitutional Convention do hereby acknowledge the sovereign right of the Scottish people to determine the form of government best suited their needs. Indeed, that Constitutional Convention was proposed in a private member's bill way back in 1980 by the SNP leader, Gordon Wilson. Now, where did that sovereign right come from? There is no written UK constitution, but fragments of an incomplete constitutional jigsaw, some predating the Treaty of Union. And for example, as already we mentioned, you have to go back as far back as the Declaration of, of Broth, a Declaration of Scottish Independence, and also of conditional monarchy. Yet the quote is, yet if he should give up, talking about Robert the Bruce, what he has begun and agree to make us or our kingdom subjects, the King of England or the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own rights and ours and make some other man who was well able to defend us as our king. For as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we in any condition be brought under English rule. That is a king there by leave of those at the time representing the people, a narrow bunch at the time, some 51 magnates and nobles, but nevertheless, he was on parole. Now, the significance of those words resonating through the centuries are that the monarch, the power to rule, was conditional on the will of the then people of Scotland. This is reflected in the fact that Queen Elizabeth is Queen of Scots and not of Scotland. Sovereignty, therefore, now exercised in this democracy by various institutions is exercised through the express will of the Scottish people, which takes me to why Queen Elizabeth is designed as Queen of England. I think if my recollection is accurate, it was Henry VIII of the Tudor dynasty who, installing himself as head of the church, embedded the divine right of kings to rule. Sovereignty, the embodiment of which was the monarch, was absolute. As through centuries, power was removed from the crown and transferred to the English parliament, so was sovereignty. And so the English parliament was indeed sovereign, but that does not overrule or supersede the conflicting principle of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. The Treaty of Union, 1706 Article 3 states that the United Kingdom be represented by one and the same Parliament to be styled the Parliament of Great Britain. The significance is that it was not a continuation of the English Parliament, nor indeed the Scottish Parliament. Sovereignty therefore for Scotland remains as it always was, with the people. I can also pray and aid the case of McCormick against the Lord Advocate, 1953 session cases. It was the blowing up of the post boxes with E2 Arnhem because Elizabeth was the first Elizabeth of Scotland. And the following remarks made obiter in that case, and I quote, considering that the union legislation extinguished the parliaments of England and Scotland and replaced them by a new parliament of Great Britain, I have difficulty in seeing why it should have been supposed that the new parliament of Great Britain must inherit all the peculiar characteristics of the English Parliament, as if all that happened in 1707 was that the Scottish representatives were admitted to the Parliament of England. That was not done. The principle of the unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctly English principle, which has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. So why the potted constitutional history lesson? lesson? Because it's significant to the legitimacy of the referendum. It is, of course, not consultative, it has legal, constitutional authority as well as political authority. In 1979 and then in 1997, there was no Scottish institution to provide a mechanism for asking the Scottish people a question on the Constitution. In 1979, the UK government took it upon itself by drawing up a referendum and, of course, drew up the questions and chose the date, 1st of March 1979, right in the middle of the winter of discontent when snow was falling over Scotland. That in itself was an omen, but the 40% rule, which effectively counted the dead and those not exercising their franchise to vote as a no, was the real treachery compounded by Sir Alec Douglas, whom on the eve of poll broadcasting we should vote no for a better deal. Plus a change, plus la même chose. Now we have our own mechanism in the Scottish Parliament, but we don't need to have a Parliament, even if this didn't exist and the Scottish people were to stream out onto the streets of our towns and cities, into our villages, on megaphone, on marches, online, and say with a clear voice, they wanted an independent Scotland again. That would be a declaration of independence and no challenge from the Palace of Westminster or the corridors of the United Nations or this place, nor any courts could gainsay it. The Scottish people would say, they'd done it.
and they'd done it their way. Thank you very much. So there you go folks, that's it there, well explained, uh, explained by Christine Graham, MSP, um, again that was over in, <clears throat> in Holyrood, Scottish uh, Parliament in Edinburgh. Michael Forsyth <clears throat> was the, the Secretary of State for, for Scotland and the exact words that he uttered in 1997 were, we are sovereign within the Union and we can walk away at any time. So there's more evidence. Uh, of, of Scottish people's sovereignty. We exercise our powers through our wishes. So it's our wishes, it's what the, the sovereigns wish. Okay, the, the sovereign should always get his wishes. His wish should always be granted. Very, very powerful command. So we don't need Scottish Parliament to decide when we vote to become independent. We already are independent. We do not need Scottish Parliament to decide in a referendum to split from the Union. We the people can do it whenever we wish, as explained in the Christine Graham audio there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> going back in the audio there, we've, we've heard as well from, from Christine Graham, a couple of markers there I'd want to, to place on the fact that she's talking about the effectively counted the dead for those who did not exercise their franchise to vote. Okay, that franchise but I want you to keep that in your mind just now because it's going to be brought up later on, okay, and what the franchise is, okay, those who did not exercise their franchise to vote, okay, so I'll cover that just shortly, what that franchise is. The Scottish Parliament has limited liability within Scotland and carries out its functions under the UK Parliament back in Westminster, okay, way back in England. I would see this as being under English rule and being controlled by the largest Crown Corporation, which is known as the Crown. Alright. Now the Crown Corporation, you me under how's that a corporation? It is a corporation, it's registered company. Right? It is a registered company trading for profit. <clears throat> okay, it's all business. Check out uh, Dun and Bradstreet. Okay, check out that website, Dun and Bradstreet. Dot com and you'll see that the Crown is a corporation trading for profit. Very, very interesting. So it's all about business. There will be a presentation specifically on this regards to the significance of the City of London as this is another matter in itself. I'm going to do this presentation just, um, just uh, soon but it would be far too big to try and incorporate this all into this one. This is just basically a basic uh, this is a basic kind of learning aid, this one. When we start talking about Crown Corporation, it's going to be quite a bit to get your head around. Um, but a wee quick, a wee quick kind of uh, overview of what it is. The Crown Corporation is based in the City of London. Okay, so now you've got London City, and then you've got City of London. You'll see the top left hand flag there. Okay, it is a total, it's like a country in itself. It's got its own jurisdictions, its own rules, its own laws and everything. Um, and that's just a one square mile within the city of London. Okay, that's basically the financial hub for the whole world. Okay. Um, it's um, They are the highest authority. They've got the highest power. Okay, as to what goes on. So when people think about the crown, they think about the queen. It's not the queen. The queen, the queen wears a crown. Okay, it can be sometimes it can be it can be misleading, but the Crown is the Crown Corporation, which goes away back to the City of London. It's got hundreds of banks operating out of it. It's the stock, it's the London Stock Exchange that operates out of it. That is the financial hub of the world. That's what rules pretty much. That's what rules pretty much the world next to the Vatican. Okay, so there's a link between the City of London, the Vatican, and uh, the State of Columbia as well. Okay, you've got there's all these things. So, um, but as I said, I will I will uh, do a presentation on that in its own because that is another matter in itself. Uh, the Queen is just a figurehead of the Crown Corporation. She doesn't hardly have much uh, to do. She does her things, uh, and the Crown Corporation do their own. She just kind of represents it. Okay, just the figurehead. She needs to get permission to go into the city of London. Okay, and she will bow to the mayor. It's quite amazing when you when you watch it. She actually bows to the mayor, so she's got to get permission to go into the city of London, and she has to bow to him. But when the mayor comes into the, it goes to Westminster, comes into London City, 
he then has to bow to the Queen because it's under her jurisdiction. You know, it's it's absolutely it's mental. Um, of, of how it kind of comes about. It's things that you you probably wouldn't be, you wouldn't believe. You couldn't believe it, but it has definitely happened. Uh, and it's not denied either. That it's you know it's all starting to come out. Okay, but as I say, I'll, I'll do a big presentation on this on it on itself at a later date. When we're talking about contracts and want to do business, then I'll decide if I want to do business and I'll decide if I want to contract. And it's unlawful to be forced into a contract. So basically, without being made aware of the full terms and conditions of a contract, it voids all contract. Okay, so statutes and acts and all these regulations and things that are in place, these are all, that's all they are, is just, they're, they're contracts. Okay, without knowing, without them making you fully aware of these terms and conditions, then there is no contract. Okay, they can't tell you, they're not telling you that you've got, you've, you've got an option whether you want to go ahead with it or not. They're telling you, you must go, you must do this, you must do that. Absolute nonsense. Okay, so because I've not made you fully aware of the, the terms and conditions, then it's void straight away anyway. Stay within Scottish constitutional law, don't stray from that. It's very important that we understand where, where, where we are with that. Okay, so it's your responsibility to know your constitutional rights and exercise them to avoid entering into anything legal. They will not teach you. A constitution member just lists the fundamental rights that you're born with. They cannot be given to you, nor can they be taken taken away from you. Okay, these are your fundamental rights and freedoms. Okay, so under Scottish constitutional law, we've got there our, our, our main documents against the, 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 the Claim of Rights Act, uh, 1689. Okay, the, the, the Declaration of Our Growth. These are, these are important documents that are still enforced to this day. So make sure that we, we know what our constitutional rights are. Okay, very, very important. Next bit we're going to talk about, and it's a the hard thing that it took me a while to get my head around. Okay, um, but if simply explained, then you should it should easily or should be easily uh, Sorry, should be easily understood. Okay, and the facts in this. Okay, so this is what they, some you, some people call it the, the 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 name game and things like that. Okay, or the the game of the name. That's just what it is. It's just a big game. Okay, it's that be character. That's what the name is. It's a character uh, in a game. All right. So, basic question here, very simple question, is if I was to give you a piece of paper, could you be that piece of paper? So if I have a piece of paper in my hand, I pass it to you and ask you, can you be that piece of paper? Simple answer, no, you cannot be it. If I was to give you a car, could you be that car? Simple answer again, the answer is no. Okay, you cannot be something that's just been given to you. I'm sure we can all agree on that. So, if you're given a name, then you have a name. You cannot be something that you have. It cannot be disputed. So regardless if somebody's trying to give you a piece of paper, they're trying to give you a car, or they give you a name, you cannot be something that has been given to you. Okay? You, only can, you can only have it. Okay? So a name, you can be called by it or known as it, but you can't be it. Okay, you cannot be that name. This cannot be disputed. So when you're born, your mother gives you a name to be called by and then registers the birth of the legal entity. This is how the birth certificate is created. Okay, so you're born, the, the actual flesh, blood and soul is born. That's the man or woman, okay, and that's what's covered under common law. And that's what's covered under your constitutional law, these, okay, that belongs to, to, to the man or woman, okay, a man or woman can only be born. Then you've got the birth, okay, that is the franchise or the legal entity to operate in legal business. At that legal name, John Smith, just say for instance, is the legal entity, but then you've got John of the family Smith, or John of the house of Smith. Okay, that would be the, the common law term of that. Um, but the actual, you just grab these two names and they battle them together. They create a legal entity now and that is a crown franchise. That name is a, the person. The person is a corporation. Okay, so that birth certificate you've got is a certificate of a registration of 
a corporation of the name of John Smith or what you know, whatever the name is. So that's what that is, that birth certificate. Um another wee case there to look at would be the Jade Jacobs case. Okay. Um research that and have a read at that for yourself. Jade Jacobs now this is about a girl who was born over in Spain or something like that. Was another born over in another country. Parents whatever were on holiday, they came back, um, they couldn't register Jade over overseas. Yep, there was no recollection of the birth happening, um, or no knowledge of it happening. They come back over to the UK, and this young girl goes all through her life, for a good part of her life, without a birth certificate. She couldn't set up bank accounts because she was not legally recognised. She did not legally exist. Okay, she didn't exist in the regal realm, the realm because she didn't have that franchise registered. Okay, that franchise wasn't there for her to operate within the legal realm. Um, based on that as well, that also means she could not commit and uh, she could not commit a legal offence because she didn't have that document there, that birth certificate, because she didn't legally exist. Okay, so um, I think uh, as it's went now that she has a, uh, been legally registered now, so she now has a legal franchise which is owned by the Crown. Um, in order for her to, to to commute now in legal Crown corporate business. Okay, so have a look at that case as well, and that kind of helps an understanding with that. With that, as she didn't legally exist, and she could not, she also couldn't commit any legal offence. You know, so what does that tell you? The birth certificate is a, is, a, is a very important document for them. Okay, they use it to finance themselves. So, by combining the given name and family name, the Crown have created the legal entity. They call it forename and surname. This is also, both of them are corporate phrases that go back hundreds of years when ships were the only way of trading for business. The ship is where it all comes from. On the ship, the people had commercial titles, which were their Mr, Mrs, Miss, Ms and Master. That's where these titles came from, was the corporate ship. Okay, that's where it all came from. If you look also, um, you'll see there the bottom part where it says common law, common law, and you've been given a name. So the name that you've been given is usually your, your given name. That would be John, yep, of the house of Smith, or the family of Smith. The same way as the Queen, the Queen is Elizabeth of the House of Windsor. That's the common law name. Okay, that's where that's that's where it is. Legal entity name would just be John Smith or Elizabeth Windsor. That's it. Okay, um, but that is the legal entity. The birth certificate is the certificate of goods. So once the ship is berthed, you are the cargo of your mother. Okay, so your your mother is the ship. Your mother gives birth to you. You're now the merchandise that the crown see, because they can now they know that they can make money from that. Okay, so you are worth money. So the franchise that you act under is worth money. The franchise is merchandise. Okay, if you look at the word birth, birth actually derives from the word birth. Yep, which the goods have been birthed. Okay, they've been birthed. The birth certificate is the nation's claim of ownership. So see certificate, uh, certificate definition in the Barons Banking Dictionary. This is where citizenship comes from. It's the nation's claim of ownership. So if we think we're citizens, then that, that's us being owned by the nation. Yep, we're owned by the UK and things like that. Which, by the way, UK is also a corporation. Okay, I'm sure it's, it's changed from, from whatever it was to now, I'm pretty sure it's now UK PLC. But again, you'll see it on, on Dun & Bradstreet, okay, on that website, you'll see it's another business, it's a corporation, it's a legal entity, okay, a legal fiction, operating for business. Okay, so citizenship, you need to be careful with that, it's not what you think it means. Okay, it's not what you think it means, that is also a legal fiction. 
Yep, so it's your name, it's your 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 franchise, your crown corporate franchise, which is the name, John Smith, that piece of paper, that document, that's all that is. Okay, that's the citizenship, that's the legal fiction, the legal entity. If you look at a, uh, any warehouse certificate of goods, you'll see it's very similar to the birth certificate. It has a serial number, description of goods, and a date of when it was birthed. Okay, very, very similar birth certificate. Okay, so again, it's, it's just merchandise. That's all you are when you're born. Words that are generally used, so when it comes to, to, to bo babies being born and things, then the words that are generally used are birth. Yep. Your birth that derives from the word birth, a ship's allotted place at a dock or wharf. Uh, a wharf. Now, if a mother was to give birth, that's them basically coming in the ship. The mother's a ship, they're coming into the, the dock, and that's where they're now going to birth their goods. The, the goods are then birthed. Before that, they go into labour. So the mum's going to labour. Labour's definition is physical work to deliver the goods. Alright, that's what it is. Delivery. Before before the mum gives birth and things like that, they go to the delivery suite and the baby's then delivered. The midwife delivers the baby. Yep, so what's the definition of delivery? It's the action of shipment of goods. And the last bit there is water's breaking. Water's break with the passing of the ship. So these are all commercial terms. This is them fitting it into a regal, uh, sorry, into a legal realm. So you've come from your mother's waters, therefore you are subject to the law of the high sea. So remember this is admiral law, the admiral law belongs at sea, admiral law, maritime law. Yep, and admiral law and maritime law is where the statutes have came from, okay? And it's all commercial, it's all commercial law, as they say. Alright, though it's worth saying the word law here, there's not real law, the only real law there is common law. Okay, that's what it is. So, when you've got your name, this name is registered to the Crown, so they own the name, they do not own you. Always remember that, they do not own you, they only own that name and the birth certificate. They only own the birth certificate. Okay, what they need now is the man or woman to operate, they need to act as it. Okay, now words that we use is act, if you're going to act as something, you can only act as a character or a title. So if you look at a soap, these soaps that you get in the telly, you've got the characters. The character itself doesn't actually really exist. Yep, they've got a man or woman acting as the character. Okay. Or you've got people acting as uh, Elizabeth Windsor. She acts as the Queen. That's the title. She can only act as a title or character. Okay, so that birth certificate, the way you look at that is, that birth certificate, and the name of that birth certificate is the person. Okay, now a person is a corporation, which I'm going to provide some evidence to that just in a wee second. Okay, but that person is the character. Okay, they need you, the man, to act as that character. They need you to act as that character, which to give it life. Because that itself, that document is dead. It's a legal entity which is, is dead. It doesn't have a heartbeat, it doesn't have a pulse. They need a man or woman to, to influence it. Okay, to give it life, and that's where they now contract with you because you've accepted to be in that piece of paper, and then you're you're, you're drawn into contract. So be very very careful of what, of what you're doing there. <clears throat> so we look at this birth certificate. Okay, you yeah, look at this birth certificate. If you accept the name and agree to be the name, then you've contracted. You've also stated that you are something that you cannot be. This is fraud, but the Crown is willing to ignore this. Okay, they're willing to ignore that because there's money to be made. You're, that, that birth certificate's a merchandise. They want you to act as that merchandise so that they can enforce their corporate rules again over you. Okay. So look at the birth certificate in your possession. It has the Crown seal on it. Okay. It belongs to them and it also states at the bottom that it's not to be used for identification. The General Register Office, uh, 
Office for Scotland. Okay, the General Register Office for Scotland shares the same logo as the PF. Okay, they're working together on this. They're, they're the registration of it. Okay, so they're a crown crown owned body, and so is the Procreator Fiscal Service. Okay, on behalf of the Crown in Scotland. All right, so check that out. The registration uh, registers office for Scotland has got the same crown seal. It's got the same company logo, if you like. Okay, it's got that crown seal on it. All right. Birth certificate. There's also Crown copyright and cannot be copied or reproduced, and if so, it's an offence. If it did belong to you, then you could do what you want with it, because it would be yours, but it's Crown, <coughs> Crown copyrighted. Okay, so you, it belongs to them, that name belongs to them. It can't be, it cannot identify you, because it states that. And it's got their company logo on it, the, the Crown seals on it, so it's theirs. Every part of that is theirs. You cut the other Crown. Uh, crown owned companies such as DVLA, it's also another crown body there. Driving licenses, the passport offices, and things like that. These are all other documents quite similar. Now, a driving license and a passport have got photographs on them. Alright, now don't let that put you off. I don't you know, very again, simply explain to you. First of all, driving license. Does it belong to you? No, you do not own a driving license, nor do you own a passport. Even if you've got one in your hand and it's got that photograph on it, that's not yours. That belong that driving license belongs to the DVLA. That's property of the DVLA. So you never own a driving license. You do not have a. You, you don't. You don't have it there. That's not yours. Okay. It's in place for you to, to use if you wish to use it for crown corporate business. Okay, that's it. Same as your passport there, okay, the photograph in it, again just because it's got its photograph in it doesn't mean that's not you, that photograph, when, when that gets, the, the counter signatory signs that off, they sign off as a true likeness, that means it's a true likeness, if it's a true likeness, if it's like you, then it's a resemblance, if something resembles you, you cannot be it, okay, or that cannot be you, it's a resemblance. Okay, it's a reflection or a, you know, as, as it's known in the in the legal game, it's known as your reflection. Okay, a, the legal entity. So when you've got that photograph on there, that there is a, is a document, it's, do, it's what they would say, documentary evidence. Okay, it's a true likeness, it's a resemblance, it's not actually you. Okay. Um, on the passport, on the back page of a passport, very back page, it's got the notes and it says on it in point seven there, it says caution. <clears throat> just going to read the first, it's, it's got maybe about 8 lines to it or things like that, but I'm only going to go read the first few lines. So this passport remains the property of Her Majesty's Government in the United Kingdom and may be withdrawn at any time. <clears throat> now it's property, so there you go, the passport is property of the Maj Her Majesty's Government. Okay. It can be withdrawn at any time, it should not be tampered with or passed to an unauthorised person. Then it goes on to you know, talk a bit, a bit more about your, you know, if, if you want to tamper with it and fraudulent stuff and things like that. Um, but that's telling you that the document, the passport, is property of the government. Okay. You open up that document there. There you've got the photograph, which is a true likeness of you. It's a resemblance. The same as you look in a mirror. You don't actually see yourself in the mirror. What you see is the reflection. Yep. The, what you see in the mirror is the true likeness. It's not actually you. It's you see a reflection. Okay. Probably just not just another way they're trying to explain that. Um, but looking back at the passport, if the passport itself is property of the government. You open up and there's the the, the, the legal entity name. You'll see it's all in, in, in all caps letters. Yeah, it's in all caps letters. That's because it refers to the dead legal entity. That's what all caps is. All right. The photographs there. That's what makes up the passport. So all that content within that passport is owned by the government. It's not your property that's in the passport. Okay, the passport and all its contents belong to the, the, the government. As stated in the back of it there. Okay, so just remember that folks, driving licenses, passports, they're not yours, they belong to the government. Okay, they're, they're, they're crown documents, and cr you know, they're crown owned as, as well. Um, the photograph on it, as I said, true likeness. A true likeness is a resemblance. 
and if something resembles you, then it's not you. Okay, it's, it's, they're just using a document, a photograph as a document. It's a true likeness of a document which they're using to put on these things. Okay, and again, it, it's it's to mislead you. Okay, it's all an illusion, but it's not you on the passport or on a driving license. <clears throat> so if you look at it as the crown being the big boss and the name is the employee. Okay. They need you to act as the name to execute their company rules, statutes upon you, just like a contract of employment. And that's how it bas that's basically how it works, okay? They're the big boss, they've got the contract in place, they've written out the, the statutory rules and contracts which that piece of paper has to abide by. Alright, but the piece of paper's dead, okay? It's not alive, it's not getting any life, so it's dead. Hence the reason why all your documents that come through, all your legal documents are all addressed to you or to, to the, the legal entity in all caps letters. Okay, it's addressed in all caps letters. Um, <clears throat> so that's because it's dead. Alright. If you breach the contract on employment, then you get punished. Okay, so the only reason you can breach that if you act as it. Okay, and if you act as that document, that birth certificate, that name, that person, which is a corporation, it's a franchise owned by the Crown, if you act as that, then that is when you then breach the contracts. Okay, so just try and stay away from it. We end up, we get coerced into acting as it. Okay, we, that's what happens, we get drawn into acting as it. That's all we've known. All our days since we've grew up through school has, has been this name. Okay, it's sometimes we've now got we've got to uneducate ourselves and re-educate ourselves and know who we really are. All right. <clears throat> so the name is a franchise for you to use if and when you wish to carry out crown corporate business. I recall signing no such contract that I'd be acting in a permanent capacity of the Crown Corporate Franchise, so I use it as and when I wish. That's the beauty of it, there's not, there's not a contract in place of how you're supposed to use that franchise, that birth certificate name, so if I want to dabble into something legal, I can use it. If I don't want to dabble into something legal, then I don't use it. It's as simple as that. There's nothing in place to state how I can use that legal franchise. Okay, the pay I can use that as and wish I went, uh, as and wish I, I, I please. Okay, same as yourself. So a person, a person as a corporation, it's the name that is the person and not the man or woman. Okay, it's quite hard to try and get your head around these, this kind of name thing and the, what a person is. A person is, is the legal fiction, is that legal entity that's been created in the birth certificate. Okay, it doesn't have a physical presence there. Looking here, um, <clears throat> a wee bit of evidence there to, to substantiate that fact. There's the Interpretation Act 1978. Now, this act bounds, basically binds the Crown. Okay, they, this is what that binds, it binds the Crown. Very interesting bit there, the, the second box where I've highlighted the word person. So, the Interpretation Act defines a body of persons, corporate or unincorporate. That's what a person is. Corporate and unincorporate are businesses. That's what they are. They're commercial businesses. They are corporated or unincorporated. They are commercial terms. Alright. Companies. Companies either corporate or unincorporate. A man can't be corporate. A woman can't be corporate or incorporate. Okay. So that's what it means. The word includes and, and the legalese language basically includes means everything else is specifically excluded. So it just means it's a body of companies or a company which is corporate or unincorporated. So there's more evidence to that and that is an actual that's a that's a statute. That's a statute there and it, it clearly states what a person is. Okay. Have a look at that, it's Interpretation Act nineteen seventy eight. Have a read through it's quite a lot of other important and, and useful information on that as well. Okay. A little bit here to <clears throat> what we're going with citizenship. 
Okay, this helps with the, the, the understanding of the, also the word person. Okay, so that person is the Crown owned uh, franchise. That birth certificate, that birth certificate name. Okay, is the own, it's a claim of ownership. And that's what a citizen is, is the claim of ownership, for the nation's claim of ownership. So, this kind of all ties in. This is the British Nationality Bill. It was back to June 1948. Now this was taken from the, the Hansard site, which is off the Parliament UK uh, website. Okay, you go in there, there's a thing called Hansard, and it gives you all the kind of case laws and, um, sorry, not case laws, um, that's sorry, yep, case laws and your, your bills and acts and things like that. Okay. Uh, reports and acts and things like that as well. So this is Lord Altrincham, uh, his own words here from the uh, his statement from, from the British Nationality Bill was that there is a very wide range within this single term of citizenship and obviously there are great differences in that range in the sense of civic rights and civic responsibilities. There are also immense v uh, varieties of governments and of rights and responsibilities varying from universal adult franchise as we have it here to no franchise at all. All those variations would be brought together under the term citizenship. In fact, to cover the colonial empire, the term citizenship must be wrenched from its proper significance. It can be defended if it is to be defended. And this is what we dislike and wish to avoid, only as a convenient legal fiction. Okay, so that legal fiction is just the entity. Okay, it has, doesn't exist. Alright. We dislike the fiction and we see no good reason for it. Citizenship, after all, ought to mean, and in its proper sense, does mean equal rights and responsibilities. Do the noble lords opposite really suppose that if that term is used in regard to the colonial empire, it will not be exploited against us by every malcontent, by every political agitator? It is a poor answer to say that, after all, the term is merely a legal fiction. That would be the truth, but as I say, it would be poor. So there you go, citizenship is a legal fiction. Okay, that's the, that's the claim of ownership. That's, that's what it is. We used to be British subjects. Now they've, they've changed that to citizenship. Other case references of person then, so the other things we can look at, Supreme Court of the United States, so these are Supreme Court cases, okay, now every government has this pretty much the same objective, regardless of the, of the country it's operating in, okay, so Supreme Court of the United States, 1795, in as much as every government is an artificial person, okay, so artificial person is, means it's not real, it's fake, it's, it's a fiction, Yep, so it's a, a, a legal entity, a fiction, artificial person, that all means the same thing. An abstraction and a creature of the mind only. Okay, so it's all hypothetical. A government can interface only with other artificial persons. So government can't interf basically interface with men or women, that's what it's saying. The imaginary, having neither actuality nor substance, is foreclosed from creating and attaining parity with the tangible. The legal manifestation of this is that no government, as well as any law, agency, aspect, court, etc., can concern itself with anything other than corporate, artificial persons and the contracts between them. Okay, so that there again, very important to understand that. Uh, reference to that there, you'll see it's uh, the, the Penhalo v. Duan's administrators. Okay. Um, next box down, the state citizen is immune from any and all government attacks and procedure. Absent contract, see Dred Scott v Sanford, uh, or as the Supreme Court has already st uh, has stated clearly, every man is independent of all laws except those prescribed by nature, which basically the ones prescribed by nature is common law. He is not bound by any institutions formed by his fellow men without his consent, Cruden versus Neil. So again, how, how much clearer does it need to be made? How much clearer does this need to be? 
Next that we'll talk about what's going on here is the Presumption of Death Scotland Act 1977. Okay. <clears throat> so according to this act, you are presumed dead if not legally heard of after seven years. But under common law, you're presumed to be alive until you reach an age of between 80 and 100. This age is not authoritatively decided. So here's the report on the act. Okay, the report on the act, again, this was taken from Hansard. You'll find out on there. And it pretty states there, starting point of the common law of Scotland is a presumption in favour of the continuance of life. So, as to throw the onus of proof of death upon the party alleging the fact, the precise duration of the presumption has not been authoritatively fixed. Still says that some extend it to 80 years of age and others to 100 years. Okay, and it kind of goes on to, to say some more, but the main point they were trying to get across is Presumption of Death Scotland Act says that you're legally dead after seven years, but under common law you're presumably still alive <laughs> until you've reached the age of probably somewhere between 80 or 100, so it's not been authoritatively decided. Crazy. So, <clears throat> Hansard, this is where you want to find that information. Okay. How can you be dead and alive at the same time? Common law is telling you you're alive, but the legality of it is that you're dead after seven years of going missing or legally unheard of, then you're presumed dead. Hmm, bit of a conflict here. Well, because there are presumably two of you, you've got the man, which is common law, and the reflection of you, which is the fiction, the true likeness of you. The birth certificate name, or the, you know, it's all legal, so you've got the crown corporate uh, entity there, crown corporate owned entity, the fiction, the franchise, whatever you want to call it, okay, and then you've also got the live man, okay, or woman. So presumably there's two of you, you've got the common law man, uh, and then you've got the legal franchise here, the entity. So, because it's not actually you, it has no life, so it must be dead. This birth certificate, as we say, it's just a piece of paper. That's just a certificate of, of there's, a, there's an entity being created. It's an artificial person, it's a, it's a crown corporation, it's a person. Oh, it is okay, it's a, it's a legal fiction. It's a, an entity, so it's got no life, it's dead, it has no physical existence. Okay, so that there is presumed dead if it's unheard of after seven years. The same way as a company is a dead legal entity. A company needs people to operate it. A company itself does not have a pulse and cannot be seen, heard or touched. It needs people to represent it and carry out its functions. Okay, so every company out there, it's just that it's an artificial thing. Yep, it's it's a, it's a fiction. It's just a creation. Yep, it doesn't. It's not alive. So therefore, people have to operate it. That's what. That's what. You know, how a, a company succeeds because of the people that the that, that operate it. <clears throat> if you also look up the legal phrase criminal capacity, it states that anyone under the age of seven lacks criminal capacity. This means after seven years of age. You are presumed dead. Okay, you're presumed dead in the water and are subject to the laws of the high sea, which is the statutes, acts and regulations. So until you reach seven years of age, you cannot commit a legal offence. Although some jurisdictions exceed this age, but they cannot reduce it. And in Scotland, it's eight years old. Okay, so after um, seven years, you're, you're presumed dead legally. Okay, but in Scotland they call this thing called criminal responsibility. So it shall be, again this is taken from the Criminal Procedure of Scotland Act 1995, it shall be conclusively presumed that no child under the age of 8 years can be guilty of any offence. So Scotland has given, Scotland has pretty much given us that extra year there. Okay, so they can't uh, decrease that age by below 7. Okay, it's got to, any jurisdiction acts from 7 upwards. So in court proceedings, go back to court, so in court proceedings, you enter the dock. Okay, that's that wee wooden box that you go in there, you 
a name gets shouted out, you are, you consent to be in the name, you then go and stand in the dock. Okay, it's a bit baffling because I thought a dock was for ships to distribute its goods. But anyway, if you ask these three questions, you enter the dock and you ask the three questions. Okay, are you John Doe? Is your date of birth? Blah blah blah. Is your address? Blah blah blah. If you reply yes to these, you have agreed to be the birth certificate name and enter into contract. This is the account that the Crown uses to finance itself. It needs somebody to give that legal entity life. Okay. Now, that are you John Doe? Is your date of birth? Blah blah blah. Is your address? Blah blah blah. These are the three questions that are asked. Now, these questions are asked in a specific manner. They don't ask you, are you called John Doe? Or are you known as John Doe? It's are you John Doe? They need somebody to stand up and be that legal entity. So if they ask that question, are you? And you say, yes I am. Then that's you now consented. Okay, that's you now acting for that legal entity. Which means now you're bound by all those statutes that apply to that, that franchise that you're going to now act as. Okay, so be very careful of how you answer these questions. Always remember, as well folks here, okay, you've been given a name, then you have a name, you cannot be something that you have. Okay, so how silly does this sound? The judge or clerk will ask you if you are something that has been given to you, which is the name. Remember, you're, you've been given a name, then you have a name, you cannot be something that you have. Imagine giving the judge a piece of paper and ask if he can be that piece of paper. The question is just as silly as the one that he's asked you. Okay, you cannot be something that has been given to you. This is a fact that cannot be disputed. Okay, and if you do act as that name, remember, it's fraud. Because you've, you've said that you are something that you can't possibly be. <clears throat> the judge will rule from the bench. Now, the word bench is the Latin word for bank. So he rules from the bank when the merchandise come into the dock. Yep, so that merchandise comes into the dock. He's going to act as the banker. Okay, so that's where the word, the banks, the banks of the water. Okay, and the dock. These are, it's all admiral terms. Okay, all admiral terms. So, he's at, he acts from the, he rules from the, the bench, which is ruling from the bank. So, he's acting now as banker. It's now all financial. Judge acts as captain or banker and the prosecution comes in with the complaint against you and the judge, who is the banker, has to settle the balance. There's pretty much a monetary value in every administrative court case. Okay, you'll look at these courts as well, look at all of these courts, they're all, they're all very similar to that of the Bank of England, which again is based in the city, uh, city of London, which we're talking about, it's a total different jurisdiction and things like that itself is its own it's its own it's like its own country it has its own jurisdiction okay that's where the bank england's based you look at these courts with the big powers and things like that that's very very similar to the bank of england okay that's all the courts are just banks so are courts designed are they designed as courts of admiralty um well simple answer there yes they are they're all admiral courts, okay, imposing admiralty statutes, admiralty rules, that's all it is. Remember everything goes back to the back to the sea, the law of the sea, admiralty, admiralty and your, your maritime laws. Okay, this is where the Crown corporate uh, owned uh, birth certificate and things like that, the person, corporations, that all goes back to the ship. Okay, so the courts of admiralty, yep. Look at the, the, the what we're talking about there, the judge rolling from the bank, the banks, yep, the dock where the ship comes in, okay, to, to distribute his goods. So admiral terms as well, they're using within the courts. Okay, more evidence to this is the Colonial Courts of Admiralty Act 1890. Okay, very, very interesting. Again, research this, have a look at this yourselves, you can get it online, we're talking about the legislation. .gov uh, website, 
put that in. Colonial Courts of Admiralty Act 1890. The first two lines pretty much say it all. Okay, they, they pretty much say it all here. Um, first couple of lines and then going into the first couple of paragraphs. So, Colonial Courts of Admiralty, every court of law in a, in a British possession, which is for the time being declared in pursuance of this act to be a court of admiralty, or which, if no such declaration is in force in <coughs> the possession, has therein original and limited civil jurisdiction, shall be a court of admiralty, with the jurisdiction in this act mentioned, and many for the purpose of that jurisdiction exercise all the powers which it possesses for the purpose of its other civil jurisdiction and such court in reference to the jurisdiction conferred by this act is in this act referred to as a colonial court of admiralty whereas uh, sorry we are in a british possession the governor is the sole judicial authority the expression court of law for the purpose of this section includes such governor the jurisdiction of a colonial court of admiralty shall subject to the provisions of this act be over the like places, persons, matters and things as the admiralty jurisdiction of the high court in England whether existing by virtue of many statute or otherwise and the colonial court of admiralty may exercise such jurisdiction in like manner and to as full an extent as the high court in England and shall have the same regard as the court to international law and the, uh, the committee of nations. Now, the, the, the court of Eng the high court of England. Uh, this is basically reiterating the fact that our courts in Scotland are all ran and by England. Okay, they're ran by England, and according to Admiralty law, that says it there. Clearly states it. All you know, right, so courts are dealing with admiral matters, they're dealing with business, that's all it is, is business is what they're dealing with, okay, which is all contractual. Here's the, the, the third section of that, uh, or sorry, the third subsection of that section of Colonial Courts of Admiralty, um, again if you want to have a read through that then you can pause, pause the video. So there's the proof. And if that's not good enough, here is another example of that. So the legal definition of the word driver is one employed in conducting a coach, carriage, wagon or other vehicle with horses, mules or other animals. Okay. This is the general legal definition. Now I'm going to go into this a wee bit here. Watch, you see some videos on YouTube and you've got people talking to police constables in regards to... Um, you know, Black's Law, this is your law, Black's Law states that, you know, driver means, uh, a definition of it, someone is employed by conducting a coach, carriage, wagon, or other vehicle with horses, mules, or other animals. Well, you, you, all Black's Law is, Black's Law itself isn't actually law, it's not a law. Okay, Black's Law is just a dictionary of general legal definitions. Now, the way the legal framework set up is that they can change the ter uh, interpretation and definition of words to suit each legislation. Okay, so that's just given a, a general legal definition, okay? It's not actually law. Okay, it's people, you hear some people in video saying that blacks, or you are, you, you, you are, you are enforcing blacks law and you know, that, that's, you know, that's just people that's not maybe educated enough uh, and this kind of matter, but Black's Law is just a dictionary of general general legal definitions. That's it. To find out the real interpretation of, of the words, as I say, that some legislations and acts have a different meaning of a word compared to another legislation or act. Okay, so look up the interpretations within the actual statute itself. You'll usually find them kind of near the end of it. You'll see interpretations go in there. Okay. So the legal, the general legal definition is one employed. Okay, so that means someone who is in service of another. Someone is carrying a service of someone in another. So you'd look at taxi drivers, delivery drivers, bus drivers. Okay, they, they, they are drivers, they are, that's what they're doing, they're, they're acting in a commercial manner. So if you're not employed while using a conveyance, surely you must be travelling then, or simply passing by. 
that is the case. A lot of these videos you see that I'm not driving, I'm just travelling. Unless you're carrying out corporate business, yep, under Admiral status, then you are only travelling. If it's for leisure, then you're only travelling or passing by. That's clearly stated within, if you look at the front page of a passport, yep, um, it states on the front page of a passport, Her Britannic Majesty's Secretary of State requests and requires in the name of Her Majesty all those whom it may concern to allow the bearer to pass freely without let or hindrance and to afford the bearer such assistance and protection as may be necessary. Okay, so they, nobody can hinder you from, from passing by or travelling. You've got the right to travel anywhere you like, okay? So if you're, you're not driving, you're not driving, you're not employed at the time, okay, you're simply travelling or simply passing by. And that you read, If you've got a passport, read the front page of it, okay. It also says on that passport to allow the bearer to pass freely, so it doesn't say the person, okay. It doesn't say anything about the, the person who's in the, in the actual, you know, the photograph that's in, within, the, within the passport. Yep, if I was holding a piece of paper and I was to give, to give that piece of paper to you, then you would be the bearer of that piece of paper. It has the right to pass freely without let or hindrance. Okay. Now, Road Traffic Act 1988. So we're talking here, we're still going on this definition of the word driver. We've given you the general definition, the general legal definition of the word driver. Okay, now police constables will argue that they are enforcing the Road Traffic Act 1988 and that the def that, that definition of the word driver does not fall within the interpretation of the Act. Now if you look up the Road Traffic Act, it does have its interpretation of the word driver in there and it's not anything like, it works on par, it's on the same grounds I suppose as, as what the general definition is, yeah, because it's all about it's all about commerce. That's what it is all about. It's all about commerce. Um, but how it's worded, it's worded completely different. Okay. So if we were to look at that, the word driver, or, uh, under interpretation of the Road Traffic Act 1998, states, now there's three important words in here. Uh, which I'll go over. So if you look at the bottom box there, it's highlighted what the actual definition of the word driver is in accordance to the Road Traffic Act 1988. So you've got driver, where a separate person acts as a steersman of a motor vehicle, or so, uh, includes, except for the purpose of section 1 of this act, that person as well as any other person engaging in the driving of the vehicle and drive is to be interpreted accordingly. So let's look at the three important ones there, we're a separate person, okay, so we've declared a person as a corporation, so it's not the man or woman, acts as a steersman, so you've got acting, you can only act as a character or act as a title, yep, so if you're acting something then you're not being you, you're acting as something else, yep, so you cannot be, you cannot be a steersman, you've got to act as a steersman. That, the, the, the third word there is that steersman. What is an actual steersman? Let's look up the definition of what a steersman is. Someone who steers a ship or boat, helmets of a vessel, it's an admiral nautical term or an admiral nautical title. So you need to act as an, an admiral nautical title in order for you to be a driver. That's, that's exactly what it is. So although the wording's completely different, it still works off the same kind, it's, it's pointing in the same direction. Yep. It's all about the, the commerce of the old commercial ship dating back hundreds of years ago. So if we look at that. <clears throat> going on to the, the, the car thing here, so you're acting in a capacity of Admiral Status, conducting Crown Corporate business. Yep, that's what you're acting as. Crown corporate business. So the word driver still means you're acting in a capacity of admiral status, 
conducting crown corporate business, either way you look at it, it still all goes back to the commercial ship. So this can still be interpreted as a driver being someone who steers a ship or boat. So you are acting as though your vehicle is a ship or boat in order for them to enforce the laws of the high seas. Admiral law, commercial law, okay, it all goes back to the commercial ship. Okay, they need you to act as a steersman. So you're now acting, you're playing the game, you're acting in this this game now as a as somebody steering a, a, a ship. Okay, it's a nautical title. It's an, or an admiral title. That's what a steersman is. Someone who controls or, or someone who steers a ship or boat. Alright folks. But that's us now now at an end. Um this again is just a very basic overview um, to help the, the kind of newer people understand it. A lot to, to maybe try and take in, I'll maybe a lot of research there. A lot of it's been given to you, but you know, do 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 your own research and things. Um, but I'm going to um, summarise based on, on 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 Scots law side of things here. Okay, so under Scots law, we the people of Scotland are sovereign. As mentioned in the Declaration of Abroad 1320, the Claim of Right Act 1689 and Case Law. These are protected for all time as stated within Article 19 of the Act of Union 1707, which means these laws still apply to this day. It can't be taken from us, but it can be hidden, and it has been for many years. We are sovereign through and through, and therefore makes us the supreme authority on the land and it's up to us to exercise our fundamental rights and freedoms. We can end any legislation we wish. We can expel or re-elect another parliament if we wish. We can expel or re-elect another monarch if we wish, and set out the duties and procedures of a monarch and parliament however we wish. The Scottish sovereigns are not a category or class of group claiming their rights. They're merely a group that are exercising their rights that every other residing Scot have, and therefore, as a nation, we are all Scottish sovereigns. And once you wake up to this corruption, you'll never go back to sleep. You'll realise you have the most powerful status on the land, and how we live up to our fundamental rights and freedoms is all in the simple, but yet most powerful command of a sovereign's wish. Be careful what you wish for. Thanks for listening.